Well, welcome back, everybody, dear friends. I'm uh, John, Father John Deere. Really happy to be here for our last of three classes on my book, The Gospel of Peace, a commentary on Matthew, Mark, and Luke from the perspective of nonviolence. We've already talked about Matthew. We've talked about Mark. So this is session three, and I want to talk about Luke. And so again, I invite you to mute yourselves and put any questions in the chat and to take a deep breath and relax. And let's begin with a little two-second prayer. So just uh, notice how you're feeling this evening as uh, we're going to turn and reflect on um, the Gospel of Luke. And uh, I invite you to breathe in the Holy Spirit of peace and enter into the presence of the God of peace who loves you infinitely. And let's welcome the nonviolent Jesus into our hearts and take a moment to ask God for whatever graces and blessings we need for ourselves and for the poor, for the whole human race. God of peace be with us now as we reflect together on uh, the gospel of Luke, the story of the nonviolent Jesus from the perspective of loving nonviolence. Bless us, strengthen us, heal us, disarm us, give us new wisdom and light and grace and energy to go forward renewed, to follow Jesus on the path of gospel nonviolence, even to the cross, even to the resurrection, that we might do our part as his faithful followers to help end war and poverty, racism, nuclear weapons, environmental destruction, in every form of violence, that we might welcome your holy reign of universal love, universal compassion, and universal peace. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So hello again and good evening, everyone, wherever you are. I'm coming to you from Chicago, traveling around the country, talking about my book, The Gospel of Peace. And in a sentence, as I've been saying, uh, the point was uh, to read the Synoptic Gospels from, from the perspective of Gandhi and Kingian nonviolence. And so we looked at Matthew and Mark, and tonight I want to just walk through Luke with, with you and point out a bunch of things, and then we'll open up for questions, and I can stay after and talk afterwards if anyone wants to. So I'm just going to dive headfirst right into all this, so buckle your seatbelts. So it says, Dear Theophilus. So right there in all, this is a completely different book, right? Luke, they say later, in the, is a doctor, is writing to a Roman official, maybe even some speculate a senator in Rome, trying to convert him to Christianity. So Luke is part one of his conversion, and the Acts of the Apostles is part two of his book, to convert this Theophilus, meaning lover of God. Luke is totally passionate about justice, healing, the, especially the sick, and the, but the poor, unconditional compassion to the poor and those in need, and women, 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 women. They're run throughout the gospel. I think, I didn't stress it enough, but they're in all the gospels, but in my opinion, they're really a lot even more in Luke. But Luke is as, as, almost as big as Matthew. There are 18 original parables in um, Luke, and we are hardly talking about any of the parables, but you know the famous ones, the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son. One I may mention is the rich man and poor Lazarus. Luke has two infancy stories, a long dramatic account of the birth of John the Baptist, and then a long dramatic account of the birth of Jesus. And what I wanted to point about John the Baptist, which you remember is the story of Zechariah, the father, the tough gold guy, and Elizabeth is expecting, and he says, the angel come, and, the, and, and he, he says to the angel, what are you, crazy? No way. And uh, the angel gets upset with Zechariah, and he's struck mute. By the way, Notice, I'm just saying, you could really study. Mary also says, hey, Gabriel, what are you talking about? But Gabriel does whatever Mary wants. Very sweet and respectful to Mary. 
I love that. I don't know what it means, but John is born and Zechariah writes down his name is John and Zechariah can speak and launches into this famous canticle, the Psalm of Zechariah, which is a hymn of praise to God. What's the point? The point is the last line. Everything is to guide our feet into the way of peace. Isn't that great? Your whole job, you child shall be called prophet of the most high. You've been anointed. You're going to prepare the way. You're going to give knowledge to all God's people about salvation, the forgiveness of all their sins, that God has tender, infinite compassion and mercy. And the daybreak, the light of a brand new day, will dawn on high and light will shine on people in darkness and in the shadow of death. Why? To guide our feet into the way of peace. That's the statement of the mission statement of John, the mission of statement of Luke, and I propose the mission statement, therefore, of every disciple of Jesus, in Luke's opinion. We are to help one another, guide each other on the path of peace. Then, and maybe most of you have heard me talk about this, if you're okay, I'm just going to keep chatting away like this, and I've been writing about this for days as I travel the country and I'm all excited. So uh, Mary is portrayed as Jesus's teacher of nonviolence. And the way I describe it is the three movements of nonviolence. Mary and the Annunciation as an image of contemplative peace and nonviolence. Mary is at prayer, clearly. And she's she has an experience of God with the angel Gabriel, who engages her in conversation. She moves from fear to confusion to what? To, hey, whatever God wants is good with me. Why? Because she said, behold, I am the servant of the God of peace. Therefore, whatever the God of peace wants, I will do. That is the key to the gospel, our identity. Elizabeth will not know who she is. Who am I? That so, And uh, we don't know who we are. And Jesus says, hey, you're peacemakers. You're all sons and daughters of the God of peace. And you love your enemies because you're sons and daughters of the God of peace. That's the first experience. Once you experience God, that leads to the second movement, which is the visitation as active nonviolence, as uh, reaching out in love to serve someone in need. In this case, Elizabeth, the elderly woman. It's so beautiful. And uh, it's a story of two women talking about God and what God is doing in their lives. And each of their stories causes the other person to rejoice. And their language is beatitudes. Blessed are you. No, blessed are you. Blessed are they. This is how the spiritual life works. Even the child rejoices. And that leads to the third movement of nonviolence, which is Mary and the Magnificat, which is total prophetic language. Mary is now greater than Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm laughing because I always I, it, it strikes me as funny. God's nonviolence is from age to age. God has thrown down the rulers from their thrones and lifted up the lowly and filled the hungry with the good things and sent the rich away empty. I always used to think Mary was like a Nic the Nicaraguan women I met when I was with the Sandinistas, or she'd be like a South African mother, a Palestinian mother, throwing down the rulers from the throne. Do you see how that might not sound so nonviolent? And it sounds a bit like John the Baptist, but that's a blessing. And rich being a sent away empty is a blessing. That's not punishment. They're learning. We're all empty. Uh, anyway, that's a it's a powerful story, the pilgrimage of Mary. And then the whole scene of the Luke's birth leads up to the angels appearing to the poor. And they can't, it says the whole multitude of the heavenly hosts. And what's the message? Peace has come on earth. 
It's spectacular. And, and uh, I think Luke begins with this call to peace, and he ends with it. In effect, he frames his gospel with the Christmas gift of peace and the resurrection gift of peace. Jesus rises from the dead, says, peace be with you. And all along, we are rejecting that gift. And we're going to hear about that when Jesus finally breaks down sobbing that no no one really wants his gift of peace. Okay, and uh, 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 I'm just going to try to say all of this fast or as best I can. Luke 4 doesn't appear anywhere else. Jesus walks into Nazareth and this incredible story that Luke sets up. And I think I call it Jesus's declaration, his announcement of the revolution, the permanent, never-ending revolution of nonviolence. And Luke frames it. It's like the Declaration of Independence or Independence Day. But for all of human history, he unrolls the scroll to Isaiah 61, which is incredible. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, good news to the poor, eyesight to those who are blind and have no vision, liberation to the captives and the freedom to the oppressed, and I'm announcing the Jubilee year is beginning, and today the scriptures are fulfilled, one of the greatest sentences in, ever uttered in human history. This is total nonviolent revolution. The Jubilee year alone from the book of Leviticus, and I think I went on probably too much in my book about it, but basically says, Okay, we are redistributing all the money on the entire planet and the resources within the end of the year. So Bezos and Gates and Trump and Biden, they give away all their money. All the oil companies, all the military, they have no more money. And it's all divided evenly with every starving and hungry and poor person on the planet. So now everybody in the planet can have good food, clean water, health care, sanitation, housing, jobs, education, not to mention dignity. Total nonviolent revolution. And what do the people do? They applaud. He's great. And then they, they have second thoughts. And then they're mad. And the whole town wants to kill them. And we could talk about that if you want, but notice the nonviolence of Jesus, how he just walks through the crowd. And that's that's a big important point for Jim Lawson. You may, some of you may remember the Zoom we had with Reverend Jim Lawson, who's 95 now, Dr. King's friend, saying he always marveled. That's clearly part of Jesus's nonviolence, that you can walk through an angry mob. I've kind of experienced that. I know what that's what he means, but it's beautiful. So Jesus forms a community, and Luke has what some think is really a resurrection account. But, you know, he's teaching in Peter's boat. And then he says, Peter, you know, we're going to go out, and Peter doesn't want to, and then they catch so many fish, and I'm going to make you fishers of men and women. Don't be afraid. But the line I wanted to call your attention is one of my favorites in the Gospels, and I think it's only in Luke. Jesus is in the boat teaching what? The Sermon on the Mount. And he finishes, and he turns to Peter, and what does he say? Put out into deep waters and lower your nets for a catch. I think that's a great sentence to go meditate on for, for like the next year. How is Jesus telling, turning to you because you've been helping him and saying, okay, we're going out. And you're going, hey, hey, look, I'm sorry. I've been working all my life and this is no fish to be had. But I'm just, okay, if you really want to, maybe. But I'm just telling you, Jesus, it's a waste of time. Um, I heard Dom, we had Dom held a camera, the famous Brazilian bishop come and speak in Berkeley. And he stayed with me and that was his whole talk. For an hour put out into deep waters that's what jesus says to every disciple isn't that beautiful um then we have luke's sermon on the plain which is the much shorter version of the sermon on the mount but much tougher 
and in particular the blessings and the woes, but he says twice love your enemies. He just says turn the other cheek. He shortens the whole kind of nonviolence training, but he definitely says go and be compassionate as God is compassionate. And some think that's an ancient uh, def I didn't even put this in the book, which I should have. I'm thinking of so many things I forgot to put in the book that some ancient Jewish mystical traditions said that God's name is compassion. And that's what Luke is referring to there, that God is infinite compassion. You go be infinitely compassionate as God. Another story that I never referred to before, I think it's in nearly all the Gospels, I think it's in all the Gospels, the Transfiguration. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Luke's version. And some of you know I wrote a whole book on this called Transfiguration. I was asked to by Random House and uh, 25 years ago, and Archbishop Tutu wrote the forward, and he couldn't believe what he wrote. But you know the story. Jesus takes James... Uh, John and Peter up the mountain. Everyone thinks it's Mount Tabor, which is the one big mountain in uh, the Galilee region. I climbed it once. It's great. has a great view of the whole Sea of Galilee. And that's the setting for Matthew, but not the Sermon on the Mount, but, you know, for at the end of Matthew, they think. Anyway, the transfiguration, he trains, he's changed, his face changes, and he becomes completely dazzling white, and now this is Luke. Moses and Elijah, now they represent the law and the prophets, appear to Jesus and talk with him about his exodus that he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem. <laughs> Peter, James, and John are sound asleep. They wake up and say, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. The cloud comes over, shadows fill, uh, takes over, they enter the cloud. They become terrified. They hear a booming voice says, this is my chosen son. Listen to him. And then it's just Jesus alone. So the key, the whole key, I think, is changed because of Luke's little phrase, which I read to you. It's not in Mark or Matthew. And I think there's a John version. and It's not there, too. And it changes the whole story. And this is what Tutu was shocked by, because it changed, you know, Anyway, um, Moses and Elijah were talking with him about his exodus that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. The transfiguration is about the cross. It's not a feel-good experience. And when the editor of Random House commissioned me, they said, John, you're to write about how all our lives are full of transfigurations. I said, that's not the story at all. In fact, we avoid the transfiguration. The transfiguration is preparation for execution. Because it says it there. Now, what's even more shocking is the more you stay with the, the story, you see just how the disciples have failed Jesus and how we have failed him. Um, <laughs> so think about that. Jesus is clearly going to be killed. He's been talking about it. He's on the top of the mountain. Here are Moses and Elijah, and they're saying to him, Holy One, you can do this. You got this. You can go all the way to Jerusalem and resist the empire and practice perfect nonviolence. And by even if they totally torture you and kill you, that's going, you are going to open the door to liberate the whole human race from its slavery to the sin of violence and war and empire, that people don't have to live this way anymore. And because they're there, he's like, okay, I can do this. Do you see? Isn't that great? And that, to me, changes the story and makes it understandable. Because... As I always joke, Peter, James, and John are like the Three Stooges or the Marx Brothers. They sleep through the transfiguration, and then they sleep through his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when Jesus is sound asleep in the boat, they're wide awake, and they think Jesus should be awake then. And do you remember I tried to explain that actually practicing nonviolence is like sleeping through a storm? It's not a big deal. But going to the cross is a different thing. 
all the way. And what do they do? And I am going to go through this because I think it's so important in the life of nonviolence. And I hope this is all okay with you and you're all surviving my ranting and raving here. But this is what I get excited about. So they're encouraging him to go all the way. Why? Because nobody is encouraging Jesus. The first thing Peter says is, Master, it is good that we are here. Don't worry, Jesus. We're in charge. We got this under control. Do you see how crazy that is? They try to control God, and that's just what you and I do every day of our lives. They're always trying to control Jesus. Big mistake, everybody. As I get older, the, the only thing to do is, whatever you say, God, I am not in control. You are. Hey, it's a good thing I'm here, God, to get this situation under control, and I'll tell you what needs to happen. We need to build a retreat center here, and it's got to have some nice rooms, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, a couple of rooms for us and our families, and let's stay here for the rest of our lives here on the nice mountaintop and looking at the nice view where we got you. Baloney. That is, a, that is the whole human instinct right there in those men. And, and they're really a symbol of the male-dominated church, sleeping through the transfiguration, then trying to control God. But I submit, friends, it's the whole human condition right there. Every one of us tries to do that. We don't understand, so we want to take control. Um, and we want to contain God forever. The cloud comes, they're terrified, and... You know, so where are we in the story? And how do you want to control God? And could you encourage Jesus to go all the way on the way of the cross? Dare you encourage others that you know to encourage them on the way of active nonviolence to resist America all the way when everyone else wants to give up? And the voice comes with a commandment. It's a commandment. It's the commandment. Listen to Jesus. That's the one person we're not listening to. And you always think, well, why doesn't God just appear from the heavens and say something to human, the human race? Okay, well, he did. And what he said was, listen to Jesus. Yeah, but we don't want to listen to Jesus. Because according to Luke, uh, just a few pages earlier, here's what Jesus had to say. Repent, believe the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Stop judging. Stop condemning. Forgive unconditionally. Be as compassionate as God. I mean, there's no room for violence in any of this. So uh, I, I think that's really a great, great story. And all I'll, I'll just say, if you read the book, I've always been enamored with Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And I went back and just looked it up just now. And it seems clear to me, Luke, if he's written the last of the three synoptic gospels, he's unpacked it and thought about it more. He's the gospel. His gospel, more than any, makes Jesus into this grassroots movement organizer who's building a global grassroots movement of nonviolence. And I think Luke does it because of the experience he gives Jesus in the transfiguration. Jesus is good to go now. Okay, I'm going to do it. And next chapter, chapter 9, verse 51, transfiguration is chapter 8. He, it says, this mythic sentence, Jesus turned and he set his face to Jerusalem. Now that's serious, folks. I'm going to do this. He's like Gandhi on the salt march. And Dr. King, I'm going from Selma to Montgomery. I'm going to Washington, D.C. on the Poor People's Campaign. Do you see what I'm saying? And he, it's a real a decision that on Jesus's part. And then he sends the 12 ahead, and then we get to Luke 10, the famous 72. Now, some of you have heard me talk about this before, and um, I think I have a whole podcast about it. I'm not sure. Uh, Ruth Ann, do you remember? Thumbs up or down? I think I do. Yeah. So, you know, I have 15 free podcasts under the Beatitudecenter.org. 
So there's a whole one on Luke 10 because I'm so excited about it. He sends the 72 unarmed disciples ahead of him, you know, with no money bag, no sword, no possessions, no walking stick, nothing. I'm sending, go on your way, go. I'm sending you like lambs into the midst of wolves, an image of total nonviolence. You are being sent, I sending you into the world of war and violence. It'd be like going into Port-au-Prince, Haiti today, which is in total insane violence, and Gaza, which is being blown up, and Ukraine, and so many places in Congo and Sudan, and so many places around the world, even here in Chicago, the violence. And they have three things, their job. This is our job description. So this is important to note. It's the three things he did, the three things he teaches the 12 to do, and now the three things he sends the 72 to do is the three things he all wants all of us to do. Number one, we are to heal everyone who has been hurt by the culture of violence. And that means everybody. We're all hurt by violence. And all these things, whether it's they're blind or lame or mute or deaf, they're all prevented from discipleship. A blind person can't see Jesus. A mute person can't hear the Christ. Um, a mute a mute person can't speak the good word. Uh, a deaf person can't hear Christ. And a blame person can't walk in the footsteps of Christ and so forth. So you're to heal. Number two, you're to expel demons. Now I mentioned this because it's really key to the synoptic gospels. Um, I'm talking about Luke 10, where he sends the 72 disciples ahead of him. And so they're to heal, and now you're to expel the demons that possess you. And that means empire, violence, war, greed, nationalism, Rome, America, racism, sexism. We're number one. I'm better than you. You're free of living in the slavery to the culture of violence and war and empire. That's where to say to one another, you don't have to be stuck in the NRA anymore. You're free. And third, you're to say and over and over, he says this, the kingdom of God is at hand. A new world is coming of total nonviolence where there's no more violence or killing or injustice. So when you go into house, say, peace be with you. If they're nice, they'll say, peace be with you to you. So stay and be have a nice meal with your new friends. And if they're not, you say, their peace, your peace will come back to you. And then you go on to the next town and say, it's all peace, 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 nonviolence and love all the time. Well, what's so fantastic, and I just looked this up again, I can marvel at it. It's, they, it's, they, they, it works. It works, everybody. They come back and it says that the 72 return rejoicing. And uh, I, I was joking in Kansas City, I think. In the original Greek, it says they came back and said, according to the original Greek, hey, this nonviolent stuff works. No, you didn't think that was funny. Okay, never mind. And Jesus says to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Satan is always the code word for the empire. Whenever a movement against empire is starts, the empire's over. If you have eyes to see. The minute Rosa Parks refused to get up in the back of the bus, segregation fell. That's what we're seeing here. The minute the Berrigans burned uh, draft files against the Vietnam War with homemade napalm, the war was coming to an end. That's what Jesus is talking about. I have given you power. That's why Martin Luther King defines nonviolence as the power that Jesus gives us. And more than that, he says, no harm will come to you. But then he starts talking about rejoicing. Now, okay, it's good that you're rejoicing, but don't rejoice because you have the power over the demons of violence. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Focus always on God, God, God. And then it says at that point, Jesus rejoiced. We've gone from rejoicing, 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 rejoicing. And he praises God and says, this is your gracious will that you should leave this to children. Well, friends, 
It's the only time in the four Gospels where Jesus is happy. I don't think I've said that before, and maybe some of you have heard me say it. Friends, it's the only time in the four Gospels where it says Jesus had joy. Why? Because his followers did what he wanted. What did they do? They went out in a movement of nonviolence into the culture of violence and announced the reign of God is at hand, which means end the war in Gaza, end the war in Ukraine, end all wars, abolish all nuclear weapons, end all racism, poverty, executions, fossil fuels, stop all the violence. God's reign of nonviolence is at hand, and he rejoices. Now, I don't have time to get into this, but if you look carefully, if you go back tonight, if you want to, in the book, I didn't tell you this, but I rewrote the book three times last year <laughs> in 10 days each. I just never went to bed. It was a little over the top. And um, I had finished the book a year ago, Christmas, but then I rewrote it. And the last version I inserted right here where we're talking, such is your gracious will. I said, if you want to look it up, for me, for me, the hardest part of the Gospels is this line. Not the, the, the parables that seem complex or like, oh, well, then the king said, go and kill everybody. Now, that I, I get all that. And he's not yelling or screaming. All that makes sense to me. But your gracious will, wait, I praise you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have revealed these things to the children and the childlike, not the wise and the learned. Such is your gracious will. I never liked that. Does that mean God's will is that most of the human race should not understand this? Or only 72 people out of the human race should get nonviolence? Do you see my problem with it? No, it's the other way around. And maybe you all see this. And it took me my time with Archbishop Tutu in South Africa to understand this. And I've written two pages about this, and then I've written a whole new book about this question. Because <laughs> to me, it's, it changes everything. The only way God can be totally nonviolent is to give us total free will. And that means allow every human being who ever lived to reject love and peace, and compassion, and nonviolence, which is what's happened. That is incredibly gracious of God to say, I'm not forcing you to choose nonviolence. I give you, you can do what you want. You can reject me. You can kill me. You can blow up the whole planet. I will try everything I can nonviolently to win you back, even to the point of suffering infinite suffering love, which is the Christ on the cross. It's so powerful, gracious will. So I, I'm just sharing with you that those are the lines that I've been praying over the most through this book. And Luke is such a genius. He leads that to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prays so hard to do God's will that he, his sweat turns to blood and an angel comes to strengthen him. And he goes to his death, you know, good to go. Um, it's very powerful teachings. And, you know, you could say, too, he learned it from his mother. Hey, I do, behold, I'm the servant of God. Let it be done according to God's will and to your word. You see what I mean? So there it is again. I don't do what I want to do. I only do what God wants me to do. That's what it means to do God's will. You no longer do your will. I no longer am in control of my life. I surrender my life to God. Your will, what do you want me to do today, God? That's what we're talking about. Only we're applying this to the whole human race. And God is so gracious that God lets this happen. Well, I'm just going through my notes. I have so much more I want to say. You all know the famous story of the Good Samaritan. What I like and what I like that I mentioned in the book was so Jesus tells the story, and who who was the one who was neighbor? 
And they, well, all right, it was the one who treated him with compassion. Go and do likewise, the horrible Samaritan. And uh, in terms of Martin Luther King, the night before he was killed by the government in his famous speech about where he'd been to the mountaintop, most of the speech was about the Good Samaritan. Of course, I think it's the greatest teachings on the Good Samaritan ever because he said things no one had ever said before. I'm talking about Dr. King. He's saying, everybody is telling me, what will happen to you if you go to Memphis? And he's saying, no, the question is, what will happen to the strikers if I don't go to Memphis? These are the poor. I'm, I can't just be going around fundraising for civil rights. Movement. I have to stop and help the garbage workers. Are you with me on this? So this is the Good Samaritan. But he says, he goes on at length. The Jericho Road, where the parable of the Good Samaritan is the most dangerous road in, in those days. And I've been on that road. You could see it's a it's all a canyon. So that's where the thieves, and that's it was the main little dirt road through the desert, and all at night, very scary. You're gonna be mugged and robbed and killed. And that's what happens in the story. And Martin Luther King says, the whole world has become the Jericho Road. Wow. Filled with robbers and people of violence and people being beaten and bloodied and thrown in ditches all over the whole world now. I not only want to relieve the suffering and show compassion to every human being in the ditch, Martin said, I want to change the Jericho Road so that there's no more robbery and killing and violence on the whole Jericho Road. You can be as safe as can be. Now that's the idea of Jesus. Like you should take the gospel and run with it all the way in the vision of Jesus. Jesus must weep thinking, hearing Martin talk that way, that the goal is to transform the whole world so there's no more violence. The Jericho Road needs to be changed from a violent road to a road of nonviolence and peace. It's brilliant. And then we get to Martha and Mary. They're in the house of his best friends, clearly Martha, Ma Mary, and Lazarus. Because the Gospel of John says, clearly these are his best friends. And they're in Bethany, which is right next to Jericho. And you all know the famous story. Martha's doing the dishes. Mary's in with the gang listening to Jesus. And Martha throws a fit. How can you leave? let her sit there when there's all these dishes to do? Right? No. You all know this, right? that everything that's been said about this for 2,000 years is total, to quote Joan Chittister, baloney. And this is not about the active life versus the contemplative life. Baloney. You think, and actually, she's right. You shouldn't, Mary shouldn't have been doing it, sitting there. And you need, somebody needs to, those women need to be in there doing the dishes. No. That's the point of the story. This is total revolution. This is illegal activity. Mary is scared. Women are not allowed to sit with holy men, with a rabbi, You and certainly not allowed not only to be near them, but to be sitting at his feet like she's one of a disciple listening to him. Are you kidding me? Jesus, stop her. If the troops come in, we're all going to be in trouble. You see? If the, if the ruling authorities come in, we're going to be arrested. The Pharisees see this. Don't you care that you, my sister has left me to do the serving? There is only need of one thing. Mary has chosen the better part and will not be taken from her. So this has always been interpreted by privileged upper class European clerics for 2,000 years as the story of Women should be serving in the kitchen and we should be sitting and be served. I'm sorry to laugh, but it's just uh, the end of patriarchy, I think. Martha's right to be upset. I'm looking at my notes um, because it's it's so rich. If you begin to see it from the revolutionary gospel nonviolence, um, Mary has taken the full position of a total disciple of the Holy One. What does a disciple do? A disciple sits at the feet of the teacher and listens. 
Disciple, the word means student. I'm sitting and I shut up and I listen to the teacher and then I go and do what the teacher says. That's life. Women are not allowed to be part of that. Oh, yes, they are. In J Jesus breaks down the wall of patriarchy and sexism and now that announces that he has come for everyone, women equally to men. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is equal. Everyone is included. No one is excluded. And then he breaks that boundary down by bringing in children into the circle. And children were just nothing. You know, I could go further and say he brings in uh, creatures. Um, the story of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you all remember that story. The rich man is wealthy and all. Lazarus is so suffering so much at his front step. The dogs are licking his womb. They both die. Abraham's in, I mean, Lazarus is in heaven with Abraham's bosom. That's He's like really with God. And the rich man is in hell and there's a conversation and Abraham's, look, I'd like to help you, but it, you know, this is the way it, it's going to be. But there's this punchline in this story, which I think is the most radical, disturbing stories in the entire Bible. Luke's parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It's really in-your-face caricatures. They talk about black and white, Celeste. I mean, very, very graphic, and there's no, no gray area. Literally, that's part of the story. There's a big chasm between heaven and hell. And that's interesting. Good people in heaven still can't help people. This, this They had their chance. So what is the point? There's The way I was taught is that the parables, you can be, they get so misinterpreted, but the real, when they were written, they have one point. And we put all these other points in them. Okay, well, yeah, but you know, uh, Father Abraham, uh, send you know, somebody down to war my brothers. Well, they have Moses and the prophets. Yeah, but if someone were to rise from the dead, and then here's the punchline, one of the most shocking punchlines in all of writing. If they did not listen to Moses and the prophets during their lifetime, they will not listen even if someone should rise from the dead. The people of the United States haven't listened to Martin Luther King. I don't know what greater voice of nonviolence you could have. Or the greatness of Dorothy Day as a total saint living with the poor and resisting war. Not to mention all the other thousands of saints we've been giving from, name anybody, from, you know, the abolitionists and suffragists to Cesar Chavez and Rosa Parks to the Berrigans and Merton, and so many great saints. Why would you think they're going to listen if someone rises from the dead? And nobody is listening, really believing that someone has risen from the dead. It's, I just invite you to, to think about that. And the point is, listen there again. If they didn't listen then, they won't listen now to someone rising from the dead. That's the commandment of God, that important word. Prayer, then, you could say, is all about listening. In prayer, you learn not to talk anymore and just listen to God and be an, an encouraging person to Jesus. Um, so he gets to Jerusalem, and we're told this heartbreaking scene only in uh, Luke. Uh, uh, well, he... he, he he breaks down sobbing. So it's so it's so touching. And that's a very important verse. I think in Luke 19, for us to pray over every day this year with what with Gaza and Ukraine and nukes, environmental destruction. To weep with Jesus over Jerusalem, which is now the whole world, and to hear the lamentation and grief and pain of Jesus saying, if today you had only known the things that make for peace. And how are you responding to that lamentation? Number one, you and I want to be the people that learn the things that make for peace. That's what we're trying to do here. And what are the things that make for peace? The Sermon on the Mount. So we want to really learn these teachings on nonviolence in the gospel. And what does that mean? Number three, we're really going to follow him 
and listen to him because that's the point of learning and listening to the teachings. Um, so I want to talk, you know, you could, he, he, I'll just say this briefly. If it were you and I, and I think this is happening to a lot of activists right now, it happened when Russia invaded Ukraine, people gave up. Their hearts were broken. They gave into depression and despair, despair and said, fine, send off money, let's kill Russians. And the same is happening over Israel and Gaza and Palestine. That's not what Jesus does either giving up in despair or resorting to violence. Jesus, when he grieves, he takes direct, nonviolent public action, twice. Number one, public street theater. He enters Jerusalem on riding on a donkey, symbolizing Ze Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. See, your king comes humble and meek and gentle and nonviolent, riding on a donkey. He will break the war chariot. He will stop the war horse. He will bend the war bow. He will break in half the war shield. And when his kingdom will have peace to peace from river to the sea to the ends of the earth, a never ending reign of peace and nonviolence. Most incredible line in the Bible. And that's the one thing Jesus does when he finally gets there. At least that's what it seems. The second thing, though, he goes in and does the civil disobedience in the temple, which we talked about. Here, if you're still with me, I'm mindful of the time, is the most difficult, another maybe most difficult key thing that I really wanted to point out to in my book and invite you to go back to it. Now, uh, Sharon knows um, the chair of the boards of the Beatitude Center is a great writer and teacher of nonviolence named Terry Wren, who wrote, a, who's done a Zoom for us, written a great book on Jesus, the peacemaker, and uh, Jesus, Gandhi, and Satyagraha, and the power of nonviolence. Um, he read my manuscript before it was published, and he said, you have to rewrite all of Luke 22. And I said, no, I'm not going to. It's way too much work. And you know, the manuscript was due on a Friday and I didn't go to sleep for two days and I rewrote it from one page to five pages. And you go, well, that's nice. Who cares? <laughs> well, it's very powerful and complicated. It's Luke 19. He's, uh, no, it's Luke 22. So it happens just after the Last Supper. I want to try to get the chronology right. And Luke. The lamentation of Jerusalem, the civil disobedience in the temple, and then the disciples say, well, what are we going to do about the Passover meal? And Jesus says, well, you go into the town, and as you're walking down, you see a man carrying the jar of water, follow him, and then you'll see, um, uh, you know, the way to go and go and ask to use their house, set up their room, right? Men don't carry water jars. Do you all know that? I guess you all know that. That's women's work. <laughs> so right there, there's so many clues that we haven't talked about that this is an Ill illegal underground movement. And Jesus is a wanted person. And so everything is done carefully and nonviolently to make sure everybody's okay. But people are, quite, are constantly mobbing Jesus. And I'm sure some rich guy said, look, if you ever need anything, you know, if you need to use a place, a getaway, or you want to have the Passover meal, just send somebody to my house. Amazing. So that's a sign. Uh, and then we have this teaching moment to the disciples. Okay. It's all back to the grassroots movement thing. Okay. Before I told you, don't carry anything. I'm sending you like lambs in the midst of wolves. No money, no sword, no walking stick, no shoes, nothing. Um, okay. Well, now, forget all that. I want you, uh, the one who has money bags should take it, and likewise a sack. And if you don't have a sword, go sell your cloak, your outer clothes, your coat, sell it, and buy a sword now. For I tell you, the scripture must be fulfilled in me, namely, he was counted among the wicked. And indeed, what is written about me is coming to fulfillment. 
And you and the disciples are like, wow, now we get to be violent. He's going to do it. We get to have swords. And we're we finally going to overthrow the Roman Empire. And they immediately say, look, here are two swords. And he says, it is enough. Incredible moment. In the Greek, truly, this time I'm not joking, and I put this in the book, it would be, be as if he said, oh, forget it. Now, what Terry was wanting me to emphasize is the key to this crazy, confusing scene is the line, for I tell you, this scripture passage must be fulfilled in me. He was counted among the wicked. Who are the wicked? In the Greek, they are violent revolutionaries. They are the zealots. Jesus will be confused and presumed to be just another violent revolutionary. And what do the violent revolutionaries have? Money and swords. So, you know, I really want to fulfill the scriptures, and they're going to be confused. Let's go for it. This, You see, he's the poetry of it all. So he's saying to them, you know, it's also testing them. He's testing their nonviolence and ours. Uh, you know, I am so misunderstood. Nobody has understood my nonviolence. You might as well get a sword and get some money. And then we're really going to be like the uh, taken the way that, that we are going to be. Okay, here are two swords. Oh, forget it. You don't, I can't even talk to you. And, you know, talk about if this day you had only understood the things that make for peace. His disciples don't get it. Friends, what's the next scene? He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's he's weeping. He's praying so hard his sweat turns to blood. Not my will, your will be done. He knows I am all alone here. Nobody believes in my way of nonviolence. And uh, the angel comes and strengthens him. If I had more time, I would talk about our job as strengthening one another to go the journey of nonviolence. And and John's gospel will do that. Um, but instead, we get Judas and the soldiers and the chief priests and the high priests. Here they are. They're all coming. They've come to get him. And um, what happens? As a one voice, the disciples say, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? It's incredible to me. So he's been teaching nonviolence. He wept because the city rejected it. He's been saying, I'm going to be misunderstood. They might, you might as well be like you have swords. Look, we got a couple of swords. Oh, God. Now here they come the soldiers. Do you want us to have the sword? And what we never talk about is that Luke describes the violence and the massacre that almost happened, if you're with me here. Um, I go on at length in the book about what the disciples should have said. They should have said, Lord, we would never count you as among with the wicked. We worship you. You are the God of peace. You know, things like that. It's all, and what? look, we got this. We're in charge again with violence. So the details are so shocking. Um, an unnamed disciple takes up the sword, cuts off the ear of the servant that's a slave. He's a victim of, already he's a victim. Now he's a victim of the community of nonviolence. His ear is cut off. What, what happened? There's blood everywhere. He's screaming. What does that mean? It means the soldiers are taking up the sword. What's going to happen next? They're going to massacre all the disciples. Everybody in the scene is about to be killed in five seconds. Maybe there's a hundred of them and 25 in the ragtag Jesus group of nonviolence. And Jesus says, stop, no more of this, and touches the ear and heals it. And he stops everybody. He prevents a massacre. He prevents killings from happening. He's not passive. He intervenes in the violence that the disciples have begun. The disciples started it. He didn't. 
but he intervenes. Everybody's always saying to me, well, what if somebody's going to th threaten you? They, well, look what our Lord did. Are we following this guy or not? No, we're not going that far. And that's what they think. Stop no more of this. I, 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 I want to write like a thousand pages about stop no more of this. That means no more wars, no more killings, no more guns, no more military, no more nuclear weapons. If you're listening to this guy and they realize how serious he is about nonviolence. So they all leave him. And where are we in the story? How have we run away from Jesus? How have we constantly asked him, do you want me to kill now? Shouldn't we support killing of the Palestinians or no, the killing of Israelis? No, the killing of Ukrainians? No, the killing of the Jews in Germany? No, the killing. There's always somebody we've got to kill to support, the, to stop the killing in the culture of insanity. Jesus says no more. That's the nonviolence is that bottom line that says we do not kill. We do not kill those who kill to show that you shouldn't kill. The days of killing are over. And he's led away, and only Luke has the crucified, executed Jesus say, forgive them, they know not what they do. And so Luke's resurrection account is this very spectacular story of Emmaus. But I'll just point out um, that, in effect, the risen Jesus does a Bible study with the two downcast disciples and explains, don't you see how nonviolence works? You see, God was with Moses and building a movement there, and then up through Jeremiah and then Isaiah, and see right here, and then the prophets, and then we were on the side of justice, and this is how the Holy Spirit works throughout history. And then it worked in St. Francis, and it's worked in the abolitionists and the suffragists, and then the Gandhi movement and Dr. King. That's what Jesus would be saying. This is how it works. And they're suddenly filled with hope, and they recognize him in the breaking of the bread, and the road of despair becomes the road of hope. The road to Emmaus becomes the road back to Jerusalem, to the scene of the crime, and their, their hearts are burning within them. And he appears and says, you are witnesses. Go, tell everybody this way of nonviolence. I hope this has been helpful. I'm not at all sure, and I'm sorry I talk so much, but um, I thank you for your patience, and I hope um, you found these kind of me talking about the book uh, encouraging to hang in there with the book. And I don't even know if you can read the whole book because it's commentary. So you, you use it through the rest of your life um, as you reflect on these various passages, or you could sit with the book for five years. But in these sessions, I was hoping just to point out different things to give you a flavor of the radical, revolutionary, total nonviolence of Jesus. And my message and my hope is that we'll all finally just say, fine, I'm done with this insane American violence and world and the whole world of violence. I'm putting all my chips into his way of nonviolence. And from now on, I'm going to be a person of contemplative, active, and prophetic nonviolence and live in universal love, universal compassion, and universal peace, and do only the will of the God of peace and surrender myself and join the campaign. So thanks for listening, everybody. So how shall we begin? Comments, questions, arguments, compliments? I'll let Ruth Ann point start us off. You're putting me on the spot. I don't Okay, have you don't have to. So uh, I'll look at it. Uh, Larry's leaving. He's got a better Zoom to go to with Bill McKibben and Al Gore. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Larry, I'm, I'm showing everybody what you wrote. Um, now that you spent, so the question about the Gospel of John, Verlia, I see your question. I actually already wrote a book on the Gospel of John, which you might like, called Lazarus Come Forth. It's a short book. I wanted to do a whole commentary, but uh, the publisher wouldn't let me. But I've really sort of done John in the Lazarus Come Forth book. And what I'm going to do next year for Lent is a whole Lenten series on John based on Lazarus Come Forth. That'll be next year. That's my plan. Uh, do you see any questions there, uh, Ruth Ann? Or does There's anybody else have a question? You could you could wave your hand. There's one from Georgette about explaining the Manic Magnificat. Okay. 
Yeah. So the Magnificat, Georgette, wherever you are, I don't see you there, but um, is written in the tradition of the prophets. You know, so Mary, you could go through any of the prophets, but always Isaiah is the main one the synoptics are imaging. But I mean, Jeremiah and uh, Daniel is the great prophet of nonviolent resistance. Uh, I, I We obey God, not rulers, things like that. Uh, only God's law. And it's also a psalm, you know, of praise, but it's totally political. As it, I mean, we have so destroyed Mary, Mary's image, in my opinion, from the only biblical text we have. Friends, the only words that are in Mary are in Luke and the one sentence she says in the Gospel of John, do whatever he tells you, <laughs> which is perfect, right? In the wedding at Cana. Those are the only words we have of Mary. The encounter with Gabriel the Beatitudes with Elizabeth, and then this Magnificat, which concludes the session. So um, just to note, there's it's so infinitely rich. Uh, and I only scratch the surface of it in my book. But, you know, there's a good popular exercise that parishes students have, which you can do at any time of the year, but is often done at Christmas or Advent, which is go and write your own Magnificat. That's a good thing to do. My soul proclaims the greatness of the God of peace. Notice my language in the book. I, my spirit rejoices in God. God has looked on God's servant and called me blessed. The mighty one has, so it's all, this has already happened. God has already done great things for me. Holy praise. God is great. Look at all that God has taken. I am the nobody on the planet. I'm a poor, unwed, homeless, refugee pregnant woman, now mother, living on the outskirts, being hunted down by the emperor, his representative, Herod. I mean, you could go on and on. The child is born, set in a manger. That's a pig's trough. It's just shocking. And the creator of the universe has picked me. And this, all this great stuff has already happened. Now, this is what's really rich, why I quoted it. God's mercy compassion, and total nonviolence is from age to age. That's what I've been trying to teach at the Beatitudes Center. It's always there. It's just not reported in the news, folks. There's more happening with creative nonviolence grassroots movements today than ever before in history, even as the world moves closer to the brink of destruction. Mary is saying all that's going to happen. God has shown power by dispersing the arrogance of mind and heart doesn't say killing them. Dispersing yeah. is setting them off to go wander and regroup. And being emptied out is a nonviolent thing because they're full of poison, if you see my image. And the hungry filled with good things. And Israel is the servant. The servant has uh, uh, been helped through mercy. And God has been faithful through God's promise to Abraham and Sarah. I think it's in your face political, and that's what I was emphasizing. It's all about God, but it's a God of peace who gets, who ends uh, the one percent owning all the resources of the world, and the weapons of the world, and this total poverty that billions are living in. That's all going to be turned upside down, and then Jesus announces it in the next chapter, actually chapter four, two chapters later, with the announcement of the jubilee year. Um, and to emphasize my reading of it, you know the story of the uh, junta in Argentina, which killed 30,000 men in the 1970s. And we now know that what they did was they had helicopters and just kept flying them out to the Pacific open Ocean and dumping them into the ocean. These poor, God rest them. So the wives and the mothers and the daughters dressed in black and stood in silence in the streets of Buenos Aires and called themselves the mothers of the disappeared and got huge global fame and presence. And they exposed what the hunter had done. They didn't say anything. 
They didn't march, but they were it was such dramatic street theater, nonviolent public action. What did they do? They held up copies of the Magnificat in Spanish. And so what happened? The dictator banned the Magnificat mm. in all of Argentina. Do you all know that? Isn't that fantastic? This is the way we should be treating the Magnificat. If we took it, if we took Mary seriously, well, if you have that kind of person as your mother, <laughs> you're going to become the greatest re nonviolent revolutionary in history. Now, I kid you not, I have met a lot of people around the world, including the mothers of violent revolutionaries and the mothers of nonviolent revolutionaries. And there are powerful people. That's all I'm trying to get at. And that uh, this all makes sense to me. And I love this. And uh, so don't think of Mary as so passive, is what I'm trying to say. She's the epitome of the strong, nonviolent woman. The greatest in that sense. This is good news, folks. This is why Jesus is a feminist. <laughs> and so forth. And why he brings down patriarchy from the get-go, among other things. Which means the end of war. And male domination and, and uh hey somebody better ask us a question or i'll keep talking you want to answer bridget's uh question in the chat sure. it's not, not about, about luke about but him. matthew about pain to caesar what is caesar's being a, a wear tax resistor is nonviolent resistant but then there is this passage no bridget you've got to go back i don't know if you have the book wherever you are hey bridget can you just wave until i see you i want to see you so i see who i'm speaking to Keep waving because I don't see you. Where are you, Bridget? In Houston, it says. Oh, un so unmute Bridget, yourself, Bridget. Maybe I don't know. No, it's okay. Bridget, yeah. I encourage you to read the book if you can. Because the question is, the quote is in, in I think, all three Synoptic Gospels. So I wrote the same thing in all three. And I had to decide to do that. And I think I said, I'm putting this in. I'm repeating myself here deliberately because it's so important. Oh, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Well, we have to pay our taxes then. No, that's the whole point. Listen to what he said. Dorothy Day said famously, so I put Dorothy's quote in each text, I think. Once you give to God what is God's, there's nothing left for Caesar. Had you heard that before, Bridget? Say thumb up. Or th Doesn't that make sense? Only Dorothy Day, who never paid taxes in her entire 82 years, either, could say, hey, everything belongs to God. Our bodies actually are not ours. Everything is God's. And once you give to God what belongs to God, there's nothing left for Caesar. That's what Jesus means. And of course, he's such a genius or at least the writers are in his language, that it goes right over our heads. And of course, the culture abuses it. And we like that. We don't want the challenge. Every single sentence Jesus says is way more radically nonviolent than you could ever imagine. Okay, Ryan, you're up. Go ahead and unmute yourself. I hope hey, you're well John, today. Uh, quick question. I don't think we've addressed it much, but I know, you know, Gandhi, when it came to like eating animals and his diet and, and nature, he was different than King. I, I feel like on nonviolence, they disagreed potentially on that, how far it went towards creation in terms of like eating and diet and all that. So what's stuff. your question? So I guess, where do you see that coming to play in terms of nonviolence towards nature, killing of animals in these gospels? So, yeah, thank you. Well, so I am a big believer that Jesus meant what he said. And later in John, he'll say, you all are going to do much greater things than me. And I thought that is one of the most beautiful and challenging lines ever. To do greater things than this guy it seems, is impossible. But that's not what, from his perspective, he, he really believes. So this is going to unleash a lightning fire of nonviolence on the planet. And what we're, we're going to end up having entire nations resist nonviolently. And Gandhi really is the first to take it to another level. There are so many great people, Francis and the abolitionists and so forth. But Gandhi did great things. Well, he went farther and I think harder than all of everybody. That's why Dr. King said he's the greatest Christian who ever lived. In that he, Gandhi's saying, I only will wear clothes I made. <laughs> Uh, somebody came up to me in a crowd recently and said, I'm going to do that. 
And I, I, I was saying, well, as long as you're working to end war and nuclear weapons and poverty and teaching total nonviolence, but you'll find that that's this, you're going to need a community of 400 like Gandhi to manage if you're going to go that route. But Jesus didn't say that. He just says you have one set of clothes you wear for the rest of your life and you're homeless. <laughs> well, anyway, um, so Gandhi, you know, said you have to be have a total to vegetarian in this day and age because of the world. We now know environmentally that the methane released from cows grown in the third world, eating all of their, you know, using from the grain grown in the third world, which is shipped to the U.S. for our McDonald's hamburgers, all of that is connected to the environment. I once heard Thich Nhat Hanh give a whole talk saying, if you care about the environment, you have to be a, a, a vegetarian. You have to be. It's not a question anymore of this, that, or the other. Not even to the harm that we do to animals or the fact that it, the meat is full of poisons and killing us with cancer and obesity. That's even, But it's the earth. Well, anyway, Gandhi could see all of that happening. That. And... Um, uh, he went very far. But what I didn't bring up, I don't think, did I mention about Jesus' image of God as a, as an animal? As a hen. As a hen. Mentioned. And yeah. that's also in Luke. That's very important. You know? I was named after Mary, Father John. Yes, thank you. Hold on a sec, Mary. Um, so I just, uh, I just wanted to say that that's very powerful that Jesus had so many images of animals because he knows so much about animals. He's from the country and the land and the trees and the fruits that God is like a mother hen, that we're like lambs. These are all very spectacular images, but no one, a poor person couldn't have meat back then. So we're, we're 2000 years later we're about to destroy the whole planet, Ryan, with nuclear weapons and fossil fuels. And it's, it's clearly we're on track. And very few Christians would agree with what I'm saying to you tonight. And to me, I think it's as plain as can be. So there's so much work to begin with. Um, I'm saying it this way because Dan Barrick, I've been a vegetarian for 42 years and trying to be a vegan. And uh, but I actually am crazy about animals. I wrote a book on animals when I was five. <laughs> OK, that's neither here nor there. It was a big 100 page book. Well, anyway, um, so Dan always said, you know, we have there's so much we've lost so much ground in Gandhi. We all need to be working full time to save the planet. And that had a big impact on me. That's why there's not enough time to talk about all these other dimensions of the Jesus life. But we've only scratched the surface. Just a second. Okay, another question about Luke. Somebody have a question about Luke. Susan Cushman, I see your hand up. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on Ryan's question and wondered if you think that the image of Jesus, the, the, the hen image um, and the animal imagery, um, do you think it it is influenced by Ezekiel, that eccentric prophet that saw uh, like, animals in that cloud the moving cloud with the wheels i know something of the prophecy but since there's so much influence going on in at this time of the older prophets on jesus i'm just wondering if that's ever occurred to you. i'm sure i haven't done the research into that but um you know there's over there's so many infinite overtones yeah and you could look that up but what we're not really talking about is you've got this 100 hebrew scripture stories you know, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Kings 1, Kings 2. And yeah. then there's the whole wisdom literature and there's all the prophets. And I, I don't know how you could put this, but let's just say in the synoptics, 90% of it is Isaiah and Daniel and the Psalms. Now that's huge right there because all the imagery of Isaiah and Daniel is total nonviolence, in my opinion, or most of it. And now Isaiah is complicated, but it's written three different people over different centuries and so forth and so yeah, on. I was going to ask but, you which Isaiah it is. Yeah, is it? yeah, yeah. But Isaiah 11 is the image of the lion and the lamb laying down. 
and the child in the midst, where all of nature is reconciled and totally disarmed and with children at the center, and there is no violence and no harm and no death. That's the most spectacular oracle. But then you have Isaiah 61 is the one Jesus is always talking about, you know, the, the suffering servants to the mission of justice. So uh, I'm not really sure, but except that there's so many animals and nature images that it's very clear he's from the outback. Jesus is a redneck country kid. <laughs> Thank he, you. And he knows the land. <laughs> and he's I a had... So a question. Anybody have a question? Mary I, Jorgensen. I had a brain hemorrhage in 1974. And I spoke so rapidly for the next 40 years time. It took place 49 years ago. But the time I was an honors student in grade 13, and I was doing so I was the first vice president of the Ontario Catholic Students Federation. I was doing good things. But it took place in November of 74, and I was 17 and a half years old. And I was a great person for numbers. I've always, but that's like, my mother named me after Mary, because she said every family should have a, a child named after Mary. And I wonder, like, Magnificat, like, how, how, how can I bring that into my life? What's that? How could what? How can I bring the Magnificat into my life? Easy. You spend every day rejoicing in God and giving thanks to God and praising God. Oh, I do, God. though. I do. Yeah, I really but wait do. a sec. But for God's nonviolent action in the world, because we don't do that. We give thanks for the end of apartheid through grassroots movements. You see what I mean? Because there's a lot of talk about movements and praise. I praise you. I thank you because you're on the side of the poor and your mercy, your action is a movement throughout history. And you've been faithful all throughout history. And what I'm saying is that continues up through the, all the movements today. We have to thank God that the, Jesus unleashed this grassroots power of confronting, and we don't. I you always say, anybody talking about it. I always say thank you, God, for not taking me in 1974.11.20. Thank you, Mary. We've got for... so many more things to do in our lives. Yes. Yeah. I and really do. I, I just encourage you as a magnificent person to to unite your prayers to the movements for Which justice movements? and peace and creation, to thank God for them and to intercede on their behalf. Because that's what to... Mary is doing. I belong, to, mm -hmm. I belong to development and peace. I belong to Pax Christi. Okay. And I, I, I think like I've, I've got most things in my life which are, are good that way. Great. Well, God bless you, Mary. I'm noticing we've we got five minutes left. Anybody else with a question or a comment? Uh, raise your hand or wave. So um, I'm presuming the, we don't. So um, let me ask you all, was this helpful at all? Yes. This, this, these three sessions, because I know it's a lot and I talk way too much, but I wrote uh, this big fat book. So uh, John Yusenchek or Catherine Perry or somebody want to jump in? You don't have to if you don't want to, but yeah, Celeste. Actually, you know, I, I think <clears throat> the benefit for me um, is that I will, you know, what you said before is I really think it's really important to engage reflectively and, and just to be constantly revisiting these things because, um, you know, you may, you did make a comment, which I did really agree with. You mentioned the meaning of the parable is this, and that's it. One of the things that I find so powerful about Jesus is that we understand the parables based on where we are in our faith journey. And as we deepen our relationship with God, the parables open more and more and more. If I can compare it to like a flower that begins to open when we first understand something. 
And then it opens even more and it deepens our understanding of it. Thank you. And, so much. and really, it's almost like a koan in that sense that you just live with it over and over and over again. So. Thank you. Catherine Perry. I, your hand is up. Uh, well, two things. So one is I want to encourage all of us, and I'm saying this out loud so I make sure I make myself accountable, to go on Amazon and write a book review because that makes such a, um, a big difference in drawing attention to uh, to this work. So uh, Thank you, take a few minutes and, and write that um, Amazon review, all of us. Uh, the second uh, point I'd make about what makes this so enriching and rich is we've heard these stories a hundred times and you bring them alive in a new and different way. And we now have a new pair of glasses uh, and uh, we'll never tell these stories to ourselves. And when we get a chance to other to other people the same way again, after hearing you tell them. Uh, and so uh, it's like, we're reading it uh, in a mature, powerful, sophisticated, challenging new way. So I thank you for that. Thank you, Catherine. You know, uh, friends, you see what I'm doing, which is I'm on this lifelong mission to teach nonviolence and the nonviolence of Jesus. And with this book and this course, I want to invite you to join me in that. Yes. Wherever you are to go even farther. What do I mean? Talk about the nonviolence of Jesus. Yes. It's actually something you can talk about, yes. you know, with people. Hey, yes. do you think Jesus was, I literally do that all the time, but you can do it too. And second of all, um, well, if you would help promote the book, especially with priests and ministers and bishops. What is the book? The Gospel of Peace, the big fat book that I have. The Gospel I have, I of Peace. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, join me on this campaign, Judy Traeger. And then we'll wrap it up. In order to um, continue this, will this be like on YouTube so that like maybe we can use it for small groups? We can show it to them and discuss it? Yes. I oh, haven't. Good. Yeah, I haven't really been saying this too much, but I'm slowly with uh, the Beatitude Center friends posting all the old Zooms on YouTube for free, um, somewhere down the line. A lot of the stuff have been posted now. Cornell West, I think, is the last one. The last, the last but one. Uh, you're welcome. To, this will be eventually there. And, Good. Uh, Good. Some, and a lot of my talks on the road are also on YouTube that I've already given. So you're welcome to look for it eventually. And they're free. However, having said that, while I got you as a captive audience, mm -hmm. to on you, the way YouTube works is you type in Beatitude Center John Deere and all it'll come up. But you have to join the Beatitude Center John Deere group. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. We've had like no advertising, like 10,000 people have watched the video of Jim Finley already. Mm -hmm. uh, once you hit a thousand, YouTube starts sending the Beatitude Center a lot of money oh. and it will go viral. Because I haven't promoted this, you all don't even know it. And I'm talking about if you register in the group. So I think we've had tens of thousands of people look at the videos and I haven't told anybody about them. We would be getting thousands of dollars from YouTube. Because we're doing very well. So if you would all do me a favor and go to YouTube and type in Beatitude Center John Deere and sign up for the free group, the number within a couple of days will rise exponentially and we're going to start getting checks. That would help me in this work. So thank you for that. Thanks for letting me give the plug. Okay, the last word to my friend John Yosenchek in Maine, and then we'll end. Yeah, I just wanted to say how recording. grateful... I am for these talks, John, and also for the book. It, as you know, I've been doing Annotation 19 Retreat the last uh, eight months or so, and I've been using uh, the exercises for contemplation and then going to your book as a commentary and then going back to prayer. And it's really been very enlivening, you know, and, uh, and just really helpful. So I'm really grateful for that. Okay, great. 
Well, everybody, thank you so much for your patience and generosity and kindness and nonviolence, letting me rant and rave uh, about the gospel of peace and Jesus and nonviolent. And thanks for helping me, supporting me by promoting the book and for all the great good you do to follow the nonviolent Jesus and proclaim the gospel of peace. And I hope all of this encourages you not to give in to despair. Let's, let's not, you know, Dan Berrigan said to me, we can't afford the luxury of despair. And Dorothy Day said, there's too much work to be done. But all of this for me is a way to encourage you to dig deeper roots into Jesus and the gospel as the times are so bad and get worse. As things get worse, dig deeper roots into the nonviolent Jesus and the gospel, and you will find strength and energy to do the vocation and mission that, of nonviolence that you've been called to do. So thank you. Pray for me. God bless everybody. I'll turn off the recording now, but I'll stay on for a few minutes if anybody wishes. So take care and bye everybody watching the recording.